بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أسعد الله مساءكم في كل مكان برعاية السيد رئيس جامعة الموصل الأستاذ الدكتور قصي كمال الدين الأحمدي المحترم وبإشراف السيد عميد كلية الآداب الدكتور محمد علي محمد عفيل المحترم تقيم كلية الآداب محاضرة علمية بعنوان تدريس الترجمة القانونية وإشكالية التكافؤ للأستاذ الدكتور باسم يحيى جاسم وتدير الجلسة الأستاذ الدكتور وفاء عبد اللطيف زين العابدين وننتقل الآن ننتقل الآن بالمايك إلى الدكتورة وفاء لتدير الجلسة تفضلي دكتورة شكرا جزيلا دكتور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أجمعين uh, we are we are happy today to have دكتور باسم يحيى جاسم uh, professor دكتور باسم يحيى جاسم he is one of our distinguished scholars of the Department of English College of Arts University of Mosul I would like uh, to welcome uh, everyone, uh, everybody here. Uh, and then I would like to introduce Dr. Basim, uh, some uh, hints at, uh, at his uh, very rich uh, uh, CV. Uh, Dr. Basim Yahya Jasim al Jaburi is a professor of applied linguistics, Department of English College of Arts, University of Mosul. He got a BA degree uh, in law from the College of Law, University of Mosul and a PhD degree from the College of Arts, University of Baghdad. He read his, uh, his, his research papers in international conferences in Malta, in Turkey, Serbia, Italy, Poland, Greece, Azerbaijan, Russia, and the United States. His major interests are language teaching, forensic linguistics, and critical thinking, and has a number of international publications in these uh, fields. Well, uh, the, the title of his uh, the title of his uh, uh, lecture today. Taban, welcome, uh, Dr. Basim. <coughs> we are uh, much, much honored to have you here uh, today. Uh, I will just uh, introduce the subject. Uh, uh, the, the title of uh, of his uh, uh, lecture is about teaching the legal translation and the problem of the equivalence equivalence finding so i would like to say something about what is legal translation legal translation may be defined as a specific type of translation used in law which is not always the case uh, as law is a culture dependent subject field it is not necessarily linguistically transparent transparency is a tra uh, in the translation can be avoided some some somewhat by the use of Latin legal terminology where possible. However, transparency can lead to gross misunderstandings in terms of a contract resulting in avoidable law suits. However, legal translation is usually done by specialized law translators. Conflicts, conflicts over the legal impact of a translation can be avoided by indicating what the text is authentic, or, or how the, te the text and why it, it is authentic. That is, uh, that is legally operative on its own terms, or instead is merely a convenience in translation. Look at the terms that, that are used here. The terminology of law, uh, transparency as a term, convenience in translation. So, convenience in translation, which itself is not legally operative. Courts only apply authentic texts and do not rely on convenience translation in uh, object, uh, object, uh, abjecating rights and the duties of the litigants. Okay, this is very brief in the, uh, of, the of how to define uh, legal translation. Dr. Basim, will come to you again, uh, and the floor is for you now. And we will. We are not going to interrupt you, inshallah. We will not see any necessity for that to interrupt you until you finish. Thank you so much. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this lecture. This lecture introduces you to legal discourse, its nature and types, the sources of difficulty in translating legal texts and finding appropriate 
legal equivalents. It also suggests a discourse-oriented approach to teaching it. This approach accounts for the different types of equivalence needed in the translation of legal discourse. Now, let us Dr. Bassem, any problem? Yes. We are, well, we are hearing you very well. Another. Okay. Now, so my lecture is entitled Teaching Legal Translation and the Problem of Equivalence. Let us start. Is the PowerPoint clear? Is it clear for everybody? Is it clear? Very, very clear, very well, clear, go ahead. So, let us start with a definition of legal translation. Legal translation, in fact, is a special type of technical translation, which involves the transcoding of a legal text in one language into another. Legal translation is often claimed to be the most difficult type of technical translation. And we are going to talk about why it is difficult to translate a legal text. Now, uh, the present lecture, the present lecture will discuss the following. Number one, the nature of legal discourse and its consequences on legal translation. Two, the sources of difficulties which students of translation often encounter when translating legal texts in general, and especially English legal texts into Arabic. Number three, we are going to talk about the types of, equ of equivalence the legal translator should look for. And finally, it suggests a discourse-oriented approach to teaching legal translation. Now, this lecture is guided by the following research questions. Number one. What are the sources of difficulty in translating English legal texts into Arabic? Number two, how can this difficulty be overcome? Number three, what teaching strategies can be adopted to overcome the difficulty of legal translation? Now, types of legal text. Before we talk about translating legal texts, let us start with the types of legal texts. Different distinctions have been made to distinguish legal texts. Let's start with Bahatia, 1987. Bahatia, 1987, draws a distinction between spoken and League and written legal discourse. Spoken legal or spoken texts, in fact, involve, uh, involve academic lectures, moods, and testimonies, whereas written texts involve codes, treaties, appeals, legal documents, verdicts, etc. Shao 2010 distinguishes four variants of written legal texts. 
legislative texts, for example, statutes, international treaties, etc. Judicial texts produced in the judicial process and, and legal scholarly texts produced by academic lawyers or legal scholars, and finally, private legal texts, which include texts written by lawyers, for example, contracts, leases, wills, litigations, and litigation deeds. Now, concerning the sources of difficulty in legal translation, various sources of difficulty have been identified in the literature. Gazin, for example, 2000, pointed to the culturally mediated nature of legal discourse and its special pragmatic nature in the types of equivalents required. Altai 2002 found, uh, found that, that legal discourse is usually, is, is usually uh, considered as unusual or as having unusual structures. Shao, on his part, point to the cultural systematic differences in laws. Well, as far as English, as far as translating English to Arabic, or as far as now is concerned, it seems to me that the major causes of difficulty in translating legal texts from English into Arabic or from Arabic into English are, number one, the differences in legal systems. Number two, the nature of the legal discourse or the legal texts or the legal language sometimes. And three, finding appropriate equivalences to create the same legal effect. Is it clear? Is everything clear? Is everything clear? Ladies and gentlemen. Very clear. Everything yeah. is clear. Yes, well, yes. Everything is clear. Well, now let us start with the differences in legal systems. Present day English or legal English or legal texts has been affected by Anglo-Saxon and Latin-speaking missionaries, Scandinavian raiders, and Norman invaders, all of whom left their marks not only on England, but also on English language. Now, by contrast, Arab and Iraqi laws have multivariate sources. For example, the family law is based on a Sharia al Islamiyah. The civil code is based on French laws. The criminal law, Iraqi criminal law, is basically based on British criminal law. And public and private international laws are based on French and the British and British international laws. So, all these, sorry, uh, well, all these uh, things will have consequences on the language of Arabic and on the legal texts of Arabic and the legal texts of English. Now, the second feature or the, sec the second characteristic is <coughs> the characteristic features of English legal texts versus Arabic legal texts. Good. I think number three sources of yes. Well, the characteristic features of English legal texts versus Arabic legal texts. 
at the lexical level, legal English is characterized by using technical terms such as real property. Real property means amwal ghayr manqula. Forfeitures, forfeitures, suqoot al haq felony, jinaya. We also find archaic expressions coming down from Latin or Old English, such as aforesaid, al-mathkur anifa, hereinafter, fi ma'yali, and thereof, or therein, therein binan ala ma taqaddam. We also have doublets or binomials, al-fadhi thunaiya. For example, cease and desist, aid, cease and desist, yamtana' wa yakuf an, aid, aid and abet, yusa'id, wa yudir. Goods and chattels, amwal manqula jamida wa amwal manqula غير جامدة كالماشية مثلاً أجلكم الله. For example, he who solicited for himself or as a third party or accepted or received a promise or a gift to perform any duties of his function or claims can be translated into من طلب لنفسه أو لغيره أو قبل أو تلقى وعدا أو هدية للقيام بأي أعمال تقع ضمن وظيفته أو اختصاصه. Now, at the syntactic level, here again I am talking about the characteristic features of of legal discourse. At the syntactic level, at the syntactic level, we find the prominence of passive constructions. In fact, legal language or legal texts are full of passive constructions. The omission of WH forms, we rarely find WH forms in legal texts. The frequent use of conditionals. Conditionals are, are one of the most important concepts in law. So conditionals are frequently used. Prepositional phrases and coordinated adverbials. Number two, the use of extremely long sentences. This is one of the characteristic features of legal texts. The legal sentence is extremely long, unlike, of course, scientific English. Embedding, embedding is also a characteristic feature of, of legal texts. Embedding, in fact, is a notable syntactic, uh, is a notable syntactic feature that characterizes legal provisions. Embedding, in fact, is a mechanism in which a clause or a phrase comes to function as a constituent of another a clause. Now, you know that embedding, we usually have a rank shift. A clause becomes a phrase, or a clause comes to function as an expansion of another main clause, either by defining it or delimiting it, or sometimes specifying what is being mentioned. For example, <coughs> no person may become a member of a Senate or a chamber, please, <coughs> or deputies who is not a national of Iraq or who has lost his civil rights. This is taken from the constitutional law of Iraq of 1928. دستوري للعراق عام 1928 لا يكون عضوا في مجلس الأعيان أو مجلس النواب من لم يكن عراقيا أو من فقد حقوقه المدنية نبه تو A sign shall not be registered as a trademark if it, is consist if it consists uh, exclusively of the shape 
which results from the nature of the goods themselves. This is taken from Iraqi trademark law of 1937. لا تسجل علامة تجارية. لا تسجل علامة تجارية إذا تألفت بالكامل من الشكل Number three, he will be treated on the offenses which he committed when he was the president. سيحاسب على الجرائم التي اقترفها عندما كان رئيسا للجمهورية. Now, at supersentential level, legal discourse is characterized by a number of features. Number one, we now concerning cohesive devices, especially anaphoric reference, are particularly low. Substitution and ellipses are generally rare. The second feature at the level of discourse, legal language tends to be impersonal. That's to say, we rarely use he, she, it, etc. Yet, first person singular is sometimes a prominent in wills, contracts, and judicial opinions, simply because the identity of the writer or of the reader or the speaker is considerable, is important. Then, precision and all-inclusive are expressed through synonymy or near synonymy. Or the, the reason for all these characteristics is that the aim is to avoid ambiguity, to make the words say what they exactly mean. This will make the information flawed borne by each sentence extremely heavy. Now, the third difficulty, which is usually faced by students of legal translation, is finding appropriate equivalence. You know that equivalence has always been a central concept in translation theory. Generally speaking, X in translation, X is said to be equivalent to Y if both denote the same entity and trigger the same association in both languages. Kola, 1989, distinguishes between denotative, connotative, and pragmatic equivalence. Well, denotative equivalence is achieved when two words or expressions refer to the same thing in the real world, or the real world, sorry. Connotative equivalence occurs when the source text and the target text words trigger the same or similar association in the mind of the native speakers of both languages. Pragmatic equivalence is achieved when the source text and the target text have the same effect on the respective reader or writer. Baker, 2011, makes a distinction between grammatical, pragmatic, and textual equivalence. Now, you know that grammatical equivalence occurs when we want, when conveying the meaning, but keeping the grammar structure of the target language intact. 
That's to say, we have to keep the syntactic structure of each language intact as far as possible. Pragmatic equivalence takes a place when the meaning conveyed has the same effect in both the target text and the, and the source text. Textual equivalence takes a place when we keep the information structure of each language intact as far as possible. Now, Sarsavik goes further in proposing equivalent legal effects as a criterion for measuring success in legal translation. So here, legal effect is important, or it is a very good criterion for evaluating the translation of a given legal text. Well, now we talk, we'll talk about the discourse-oriented approach to legal equivalence. I suggest a discourse-oriented approach to legal equivalence. Equivalence in legal discourse should be viewed in a wider perspective. It should encompass legal, uh, sorry, lexical, syntactic, and discourse equivalence. In contrast to the item-centered approach, which focuses, which relegates, in fact, which relegates equivalence to lexical equivalence, the discourse-oriented approach will account for all these types of equivalence. I mean lexical equivalence, grammatical equivalence, and discourse equivalence. Let us start with the lexical equivalence, which should be taken into consideration when translating legal texts. Lexical items, now, lexical items are viewed in terms of their relations with other items. So this is included in lexical cohesion. This is achieved through reiteration and collocation and how these can be represented in the target text. What does this mean? It means that when teaching lexical items or legal items, we have to account for the relationship between the lexical item under consideration and all other items that, are, that may correlate with it or that may have some affinity with or relation with it. Now, <coughs> consider the following example. Private property is protected and the owner shall have the right to benefit, exploit, and dispose of a private property within the limits of the law. Note how private property in the first one and the second one are translated into Arabic. Al Mulkiya al Khassa Masuna, wa yahuku lil Maliki al Intifa biha, wa stirlaliha, wa tasaruf biha, wa fal kanun. Note here in Arabic we have not repeated the private uh, property, although it is repeated in the, uh, in the uh, English text. Collocation. Collocation, you know, is the tendency of a word to regularly co-occur with another in a given linguistic context. So in collocation, we are concerned with the with how the word or a given word, a given lexical item, co-occur with another item in different combinations to provide different meanings. 
Note how the verb pass, for example, has different renderings in Arabic according to the collocates that attach the node or the recurrent part. For example, pass in pass a judgment is translated as yusdur hukman. In pass a counterfeit money, yurawiju nukudan, yurawiju. But pass a property, pass here is translated as yankul, yankul milkiya. Physical. Physical may enter with different types of collocates. For example, in physical asset, physical is translated as usul, uh, uh, thabita, physical assets, is translated as usul thabita. Physical in physical force is translated as quwa maddiya. Physical necessity, dharura mulzima, and physical incapacity is translated as ajiz bedini. So when translating legal texts, we have to take into consideration the collocates or collocation, because a word may have different meanings according to the words they are associated with. Grammatical equivalence. You know that grammar is basically concerned with forms and arrangements. This is why grammar is divided into two parts, uh, morphology and syntax. Morphology is basically concerned with how words are formed, and syntax is concerned with how words are arranged meaningfully to form a complete sentence. So each language, uh, each language has its own set of arrangements of its functional elements. The sequence of words in a given language has a bearing on the degree of importance of the speaker or writer gives to the items of information conveyed. That's to say, foregrounding and deferment here. I'm talking about foregrounding and deferment of the information in the textual structure of the message imparted. Well, in English, passive constructions may or may not include the door of the action. This will have a bearing on translation. In Arabic, you know, passive constructions can be translated into in two ways. As passive constructions, <coughs> when the agent when the agent is not specified in the same sentence or text and as and as an active construction constructions when the agent is specified consider the following examples ministers are forbidden to buy or lease any of the movable or immovable property of the state. Yuharram, not here. Ministers are forbidden. Yuharram, ala al wizara, shira, aw ijar, ayin min al amwal al mankula, aw gayr al mankula lil dawla. Note here, the sentence in English is impassive, and also in, in Arabic, yuharram, or the sentence is also impassive. But consider the second example. Decisions shall be taken by a majority of votes of the members present unless otherwise provided by this law. Note the translation. Unless otherwise provided by this law. تتخذ القرارات بأغلبية أصوات الأعضاء الحاضرين so here in Arabic, the, in English, the sentence is, is passive, whereas in Arabic, the sentence is inactive. I mean, ما لم ينص هذا القانون على خلاف ذلك. Do you 
This course equivalence. You know that word order can be studied at sentence level and at <coughs> and at supra sentential or discourse level. Is my sound is it clear? Is it clear? Very, very clear, Doctor. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, at discourse level, word order is viewed in terms of its effect on the information structure of the message of the speaker or writer or, or what the writer wants to convey. So word order here has a bearing, has an effect on the information structure. The discourse-oriented approach, which I adopt, views a sentence as a grammatical unit having functional elements, subject, verb, object, etc. And also as a semantic unit consisting of two segments, theme and theme. Here I am talking about the sentence, but I am talking about the sentence from the semantic point of view, not from the syntactic point of view, not from the functional elements. I am talking about the semantic units, theme and dream. The theme acts as a point of orientation, and the ream is what is mentioned about the ream. It is the very information that the speaker or the writer wants to convey. Now, another important point can, is another important point concerning translation is existential there. You know that there is usually followed by a form of be. There is, there was, there are, there were, etc. Existential there is used to introduce new information. In Arab in Arabic, in Arabic, it is realized by deferring the enunciative and fronting the incoative, as in the example below. There is another eyewitness at the door. Note here, ثم تشاهد عيان آخر or عند الباب طبعا or عند الباب شاهد عيان آخر هنا لا يجوز الابتداء بنكرة لذلك نقول إما ثم تشاهد بل لا يقول شاهد عيان آخر في الباب ثم تشاهد عيان آخر أو عند الباب شاهد عيان آخر Well, in thematization a sentence element is isolated as topic and shifted to the initial initial position as in the example below. In the way he pronounced the plosives, she was able to recognize him. This can be translated in two ways. أو من خلال الطريقة التي كان يرفض بها الأصوات الانفجارية استطاعت التعرف عليه. Here we have different uh, information structure or we have different arrangement of the information structure. So information structure in English and Arabic, legal text, especially in civil proceedings and penal code is different. Note here to Pay, please pay attention to this important point. The information structure in English and Arabic is different in law. In legal provisions, legal provisions in Arabic start with penalty rather than criminal act or behavior, while legal provisions in English start with the criminal act or behavior rather than penalty. In Arabic, So, consider the following. يعاقب بالحبس مدة لا تزيد عن سنتين وبغرامة لا تزيد عن مئتي دينار أو بإحدى هاتين العقوبتين كل من استعمل أو انتفع بغير حق بمحرر صحيح صادر للغير. Note here, any person who unlawfully makes use of or benefits from a genuine document issued 
for the use, etc., etc. Now, is benefit of another is punishable. Note the place of is punishable in the middle of the sentence, whereas your aqab at the beginning is punishable by a period of detention not exceeding two years plus, etc., etc. So note here, we in Arabic, we start with the penalty, whereas in English, we usually start with the action or the criminal behavior. So we have to pay attention to the place of, uh, to the information structure and how it is, how the information is structured in English, legal texts in English and Arabic. The discourse oriented approach to teaching legal translation. Now, in order to overcome the difficulties faced in the translation, in the translation of legal texts, and in order to account or of all these types of equivalence, the discourse oriented approach to teaching legal translation has been suggested. This approach suggests doing, number one, textual analysis. When teaching a translation, when we want to draw students' attention to equivalence, we have to start with making a textual analysis of the legal text, highlighting. Highlighting what? Highlighting, number one, lexical relations, collocations, and aspects of lexical cohesion and how they can be represented in the target texts to achieve lexical equivalence. Number two, grammatical analysis of the legal sentence or text, paying special attention to the word order, embedding in passive constructions, looking for grammatical equivalence in the target text. And finally, doing discourse analysis to see how the information is introduced and sequenced in order to achieve discourse equivalence. In order to implement this approach in legal translation classroom, the following steps are suggested. Number one, the teacher is expected to ask students to read the source text closely, looking up the new words in a legal or a bilingual dictionary. Two, draw the student's attention to the relationship that may exist between lexical items within a text, of course, and how they are interrelated to achieve lexical cohesion. Number three, the teacher is expected to analyze the syntactic structure of the source language, identifying the main clauses, the embedded clauses, and their functions in specifying the referent, especially when the sentence is long or when it contains embedded constructions. Passive constructions should be highlighted, especially when the agent is specified. Number four, the teacher is expected to draw the student's attention to the distribution of the information in the source text, reminding the students that, this, that, <coughs> that the distribution and sequence of information may be changed to produce optimal legal of equivalence in the target text. In conclusion, it is hoped that the present lecture has introduced sensible answers to the questions that have already been raised concerning the sources of difficulty in providing optimal language, optimal legal equivalence, and the discourse-oriented approach to teaching legal translation if such <coughs> if such equivalence is sought. Thank you very much for your attentive listening.
then we have, or I, have, I have also selected references for anybody who wants to go back to the references. Thank you very much again. Thank, okay, Doctor uh, Doctor Basim, thank you so much now, for this. I welcome, and I appreciate any question. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor Basim, for this very Most informative, welcome. very informative, very uh, interesting topic, and for, for 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 the wonderful examples and the wonderful explanation you gave us. Uh, so. Um, uh, I, I just would like uh, to ask you first before my audience about yes. the problems uh, faced by um, certified or sworn translators when they have legal terms and terminology. Uh, I think that uh, there are many problems they face with this. So what is the advice that you would like to, to, to give us? Concerning what? Concerning uh, certified translators, they, they just have BA in the translation, for instance. Uh, how, can, uh, how, how can they, uh, uh, let me say, harness the terminology that you have given us, which are very difficult to, to harness? Terminology, is, terminology yeah. is one of the problems for the legal translator, but it is not the only problem. As I said, the information structure should be taken into consideration how the information is structured in the legal text, the relationship between lexical element and another in the legal text. We shouldn't stick to the lexical items only. Collocation is very important because a word may have different meanings with different collocations. So all these should be taken into consideration when translating legal texts. I remember Dr. Bassem one day, uh, a judge from uh, the Court of Appeal in Mosul asked me to translate a contract uh, between uh, a, uh, a company from Kurdistan. Uh, and uh, this company had to uh, uh, make some uh, project at the hospital, Ibn al Athir Hospital. And yes. uh, when I translated it into, into Arabic, he told me that. This is the fifth time we ask translators in order to understand whether it is aqid mulzim. Is it aqid mulzim or not? He told me that it is only you who showed me that it is aqid mulzim. And this way I could rule, I could make, I could make binding, a ruling. No, aqid mulzim, binding contract. Exactly, the binding con contract. He told me that it is only you who gave me the impression that this is a binding comp contract and in this way I could make my own ruling for, for this problem. So look at the translation, how it is very serious. Binding is guessed, binding no. is guessed from the, the language of the contract. Binding. Exactly, is, exactly. Yes, it must be guessed from the language used in the contract. Exactly, exactly. Okay, now uh, we would like to open discussion. Uh, if you have any question, please go ahead. I will see maybe in the in the chat if there is any question. Victor Awafa. No, no. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Awafa. Ustad Qutayba, ahlan wa sahlan. Thank you, Professor Bassem, for this marvelous uh, presentation. Most welcome, Mr. Qutayba. Thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, those who prepared for this discussion. Uh, Dr. Bassem, um, it is a very interesting subject talking about uh, legal translation. Uh, as we know that uh, legal translation is one part of the so many we have many other types of translation. Yes. Uh, and legal translation is one of those uh, types of uh, translation. Technical At the very language. beginning you mentioned or it is mentioned actually in your discussion that we have what is called the um, um, spoken translation or legal spoken translation yes. and written spo and written tr legal translation. Yes. Is that right? Yes. We have spoken texts and written texts, yeah. I mean. Okay. Yes. My question is that do we have yes. or is there any difference between what is called um, a spoken translation, a spoken legal translation, or and written legal translation? 
Of course, of course. Now, when I want to translate a testimony, I mean shahada, shahada yes. Korea, a testimony, the interpreter is expected to master uh, the legal terms, the information structure, yes. the yes. grammar of both languages. So here in this testimony, in front of the uh, police uh, officer, or in front yeah. of the judge, uh, here we, the, 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 the translator is, or the interpreter, in fact, the, inter the interpreter is expected yeah. to master both languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because um, as we know, uh, Professor Basin, because we are dealing with uh, legal translation, and we know that law is the law, whether it is spoken or written. Yes. So you are, I'm an interpreter or translator. He is not so free to, I mean, to play with words or to play with items in doing the translation. Well, in fact, now another important point in spoken translation or interpreting, uh, supra, let us say, uh, we are not talking about only what is said, but how it is said. Okay, so the way yeah. the, uh, the witness says his testimony or introduces yeah. his testimony, this is also important. Pragmatics yeah. here is important because in the pragmatics, we have to take into consideration the context, yes. who the speaker is, in what situation, what is the relationship between the criminal or the defendant and the yeah. witness. And the witness. Yeah. This is quite right. Quite right, quite right. Thank you very much, Professor Bassem, and thank you very much, Professor Ofa. Most welcome. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, can yes, I ask please. a question? Can I ask a question? Before? Okay, any other question? Yes. yes. Can you uh, give us your name? Uh, Mahfoud Khalaf Mahmoud uh, from the English department. Okay, Dr. Khalaf, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Dr. Bartim, I think uh, uh, just to comment on the uh, uh, notes by Ustad uh, Koteva, uh, I think we have to distingu distinguish between two types of uh, discourse. Uh, the, the proceedings and the legal discussions in general and the wordings of laws. There is a, a big difference between the two. <coughs> Uh, because the law is, uh, in, in, from the, uh, uh, in the light of pragmatics, is a speech act. And there are keywords that have the effect, the elocutionary effect. Uh, therefore, we should, I think we should distinguish between the two. Uh, this is one thing. The, the second thing, uh, I think that the information structuring uh, in the legal uh, language is different. Because we do not have, uh, usually we do not have, uh, given information, most of the things that are uh, said in the in the law, uh, I mean the law itself, not the legal discussion. Most of the uh, information is in fact new. I mean the whether whether it is a crime or a punishment. When we talk about the crime, after that it becomes uh, given. But at the beginning. Uh, both types of information, I think, uh, are considered as given. What do you think about this, Doctor? Yes. Well, I'd like to say an important thing. Not everything said in the deposition or in the witness stand is a speech act. A speech act, a speech is said to be a speech act when gets things done. So not, not everything said in the deposition mm -hmm. or in the cross-examination or in the testimony is regarded as a speech act. But again, in interpreting or in courtroom interpreting, a special attention should be paid to paralinguistic features, not only linguistic features, okay? And whereas in, when, whereas in legal translation, we pay no attention to the paralinguistic features. Yes. 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 Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Most welcome.
Any other comment? Any other question? Any Nobody? other question, please? Any Nobody? other question? And no question. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdullah, uh, shall we? Mungkin ninhi jalsa? No. Maku. Dr. Ufa, al-Afu. Naam, naam. Naam. دكتور أوفا نعم. أعتقد نعم. أكو بالشات نعم. أسئلة كلش قيمة لو لو حضرتك تشوفيها والله ماذا أشوف أسئلة وين ماني تانكس دكتور 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 أوس عادل نعم. طرح سؤال دك... نعم اللطيف أستاذ لطيف you have mentioned one of the difficulties of legal أستاذ لطيف أيضا طرح سؤال نعم نعم you have mentioned uh, one of the difficulties of legal translation is legal system How? That's not it. Yes, sir. I'm not going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. You have mentioned one of the difficulties of legal translation as legal systems. How? Yes. Good. As I said, we have, when translating English into Arabic or Arabic into English, we are completely before two completely different legal systems. Each legal system has its own sources, and we have to take into consideration these sources. By contrast, يعني, for example, when I, when I want to translate, for example, family law from English into Arabic or from Arabic into English, we <laughs> have to take <laughs> I have to take into consideration the sources of the family law. You see, when I translate, for example, a text from the civil code, al al Madani, I have to take into consideration that the source of the uh, the source of the civil code in Iraq, uh, Iraqi civil code, the source of the Iraqi civil code is French rather than English. So terminology may be different, uh, how things are uh, concerned and how things are dealt with are different. So I have to take into consideration all these things. So I have to take into consideration the different sources, the different legal systems, all these should be, uh, all these have a bearing on translation. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Basim. Another question from Aus Abdul Wahab. Yes. Uh, this is uh, the, the text of what he says. Thank you for the lecture. I have this question. And Can the legal translator make changes in the order of the information in the original text, given the differences between the Arabic and English languages? Are there definitely, any more? Definitely. Are, yes. We have, have to make changes. Hello, hello yes. Dr. Awafa. Can you, can you please give me a time to speak about this lecture? I'm, yes, yes, I'm yes, of course. مرحبا مرحبا استاذ سليمان كل الهلا كل الهلا وات از سبرايز اي والله اي ود لايك تو ثانك الدكتور وفاء اند دكتور باسم فور ذير اي مين بارتيسيبيشن ان ذس بيوتيفول ليكتشر اند اي اولسو ود لايك تو ثانك دكتور باسم بيكوز هي هاز بريزنتد ا فيري هايلي سبيشاليز ليكتشر اون اي مين ليجل ترانسليشن بيكوز ليجل ترانسليشن از نوت ان ايزي وان از ويل از It, uh, uh, it needs somebody who has been specialized in this legal, uh, uh, legal terminology and legal law. Because culture is very important also, I would like to mention this in this lecture. I would like to thank everybody who has participated in this lecture. And I would like to thank Dr. Wafa, Dr. Basim, as well as Dr. Abdullah uh, Khdayr al ubaidi And thank you very much. And I miss you all again and again. And we hope that everything will be okay with you. We thank miss you. you too, my we dear friend. <laughs> we miss you we too. Miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so my much, Mr. Uh, Sleiman. Uh, another. Uh, are you done with the question uh, uh, addressed by uh, Mr. Aus yes. Abdul Wahab? Yes. Yeah. Well. Are you done? Yes. yes, we, yeah, 
uh, you said that can the legal translator make changes? Of course, he has to make changes. He has to uh, he has to uh, provide the reader with the same legal effect. In order to provide the reader with the same legal effect, we have to change sometimes the information structure. We have to change the uh, the word order sometimes, as is the as in the case of uh, passive construction with the door of the action. In this case, we have to change. We have to change uh, passive construction into active construction because in Arabic, in English, we cannot have passive construction and the doer of the action mentioned at the end of the sentence. Yes. Okay, thank you. Another question, uh, again, from Latif, Ustad Latif. Is yes. teaching legal translation considered one of the main components to students of law? I think so. One of the, what? What uh, is teaching legal translation considered one of the main components to students of law? From, I think, of course. I, yes, I, I think, think so. I yeah. think so, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. We, are, we are after helping them translate legal texts. So it seems to me that translate translation legal translation should be part of teaching legal language in the College of Law. I think uh, that's all the questions I can read now. Uh, no, 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 there are other <laughs> questions. Where? where, where, where Zainab is asking. Yes. Okay. Do you want me to read it or you? you Where's Zainab Ta'i. Zainab Ta'i Fog. I could I could comment. Uh, my question, uh, Muhammad Tahir Sattam, my question is, which is more suitable for legal language? We, uh, pardon, we, we, which, pardon? Uh, my question is this, uh, which is more suitable for legal language, semantic or communicative translation? In fact, I don't like this dichotomy, huh? linguistic or communicative. It depends on the situation it depends on the type of the text and it depends on the function of the text sometimes we follow linguistic translation and sometimes we follow communicative translation when the exact words are considered we have to follow the linguistic translation but if the exact words are not considered i may use communicative translation so there is no clear cut line between the two in legal translation. Okay, thank Dr. you, Dr. Basim. Zainab al uh, I think in the introduction or in the, in the uh, uh, definition part of legal translation, which I presented in very few, few words, uh, that uh, legal translation is culture dependent. She, she asked the, uh, about this. Does the culture affect on the legal text translation? Yes, of course. I yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh it is culture bound, translate uh, legal. Each society, each culture has its own ways of thinking, has its own style of living, has its own laws, of course. So law is culture bound. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, it is culture bound. Okay. I, I'm looking for other uh, other uh, is teaching legal. I think we have read this. Because I'm going up for the beginning of the lecture to see whether there are more questions. I think we are done. Uh, I think we are done with the questions. Any more questions? Dr. Salem, do you have a question? <laughs> Zainab al she says that uh, I wasn't uh, here at the beginning of the, of the lecture. So she says that I didn't hear that. Translation is uh, legal. Translation is culture dependent. I think any translation is culture dependent. Any translation is culture dependent. We cannot do away without uh, minding the the cultural elements or the cultural depth of the of the language itself. Okay. Uh, 
uh, any any other uh, synopsis any other addition any other uh, request comment illumination comments addition assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam ahmed muhammad jasim hamadi hatta allah bak doctor bil master دكتور الأولى تصير ندوة ثانية عن الترجمة بالنصوص القرآنية النصوص القرآنية والترجمة دكتور هو يقول يا ريت تسوي الندوة على على ترجمة القرآن والله ترجمة القرآن يا هذا 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 الموضوع يعني مشغول جدا 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 يعني اكو ترجمات هائله لترجمات القران، اخرها ترجمه الهلالي اللي اللي اخر شيء اعتمدت من قبل السعوديه. كانوا قبل يعتمدون على شو اسمه هذا علي علي عبد الله يمكن اسمه اسمه، بعدين جت الطائفيه فقالوا هذا الباكستاني عنده ميول طائفيه وكذا فما بعد يعتمدون الترجمه مالته. اعتمدوا على ترجمه الهلالي. عيني كريم يوسف سد البرزنتيشن مالتك خربت المحاضره مالنا كريم يوسف كريم يوسف حتى نرجع على نعم كريم يوسف كريم يوسف كريم يوسف از برزنتينج دكتوره ذير از خلود سيوان اسكينج ا كويستشن اوكي خلود ترانسليشن ديفرنت فروم تايم تو تايم Khulud Siwan, is legal translation different from time to time? Yes, I think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. It has nothing to do with time, of course. Uh, it only if it, it, dep uh, it depends on the changing of the of the law, doctor. It can <laughs> changing of the law, so we change the the yes. language. Okay. Yeah. Any any other question, please, Doctor Rafa. Assalamu alaikum. Ahla, Dr. Salim. Ahla, no, Salim. Tfadl. Thanks so much for this interesting uh, presentation. Uh, just I want to make a point, uh, as uh, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Bassem, uh, mentioned, uh, the central problem of uh, translation is to find equivalence. This is uh, well known in, each, in every text that should be translated. But I think here, the main problematic area that the translator may encounter in the process of translating legal text is how to recreate the same genre from Arabic into English or from English into, into Arabic. And you know that genre is cultural context and, cannot, and can only be analyzed within contextual configuration. I think mood, feel, tenor. So I think this point should be considered in the process of a translation or in teaching a translation. So uh, just I want to, to, to what, what, what do you think, uh, Dr. Bassem? Well, in translation, especially in written translation, we are not concerned with context. We are with what? interested with context. We are interested yes. with co-text. You see, no. only in only in spoken translation, context is important. Be simply because in written translation, I have a text and I want to translate or <coughs> to render this text into another language. The context is not important for me because I have no idea about the context. But in spoken interpreting, in interpreting, the context is important. Why? Because who the defendant is, who the judge is, who the witness is, how how is the how is the testimony conveyed? All these are important and all these have contextual implications. So context is important only in interpreting. In written translation, it seems to me that the context 
is not, uh, uh, by the way, the context here, I mean the situational context. The context is highly significant, but the context or the situational context is, uh, is not important in uh, written translation. But I think this the context, when, when we analyze or when we take the approach, discourse-oriented approach, in the translation, yes. I think yes. context is a must, and it and it and context and context, they go, context they go hand in hand. Yeah. Excuse me, Doctor Salem. I yes. mean, context, the relationship between one linguistic element and other and another linguistic element within the same text. The context is the relationship between the relation between the linguistic element and something outside the context. You yes. see the difference. This is why I said. I am particularly interested in context rather than context. Okay, thanks a lot. Most welcome. Thank you, Dr. Salem. Thanks okay. a lot. No, Dr. Thank Salem. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay. No other question? Any commentary? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, Dr. Afaus. Kill the Dr. Salam. Salam, Dr. Afaus. جيدة بس أحب أذكر شيء يعني قرأتونه في يوم ما عن الترجمة القانونية وكيف تسببت ترجمة المترجم في ضياع جزء من الأراضي اللي احتلتها إسرائيل في عام 1967 عندما تم ترجمة القرار بصورة خاطئة من قبل المترجم باللغة الإنجليزية وهو تحت عنوان هل تسبب المترجم في ضياع الأراضي التي احتلتها إسرائيل في عام 67 يقول لم يثر قرار دولي ما أثاره قرار 242 الصادر الزدين عني أشياء الشخصية طلعت العفو دكتورة فوز تفضل نعم يقول لم يثر قرار دولي ما أثاره قرار 242 الصادر بالإجماع عن مجلس الأمن التابع للأمم المتحدة من جدل حول فحواه بل حول لغته على وجه الخصوص فقد صدر القرار مطالب إسرائيل بالانسحاب مما احتلته من أراضي في خمس حزيران عام 1967 ومؤكدا مبدأ مهم في القانون الدولي هو عدم جواز الاستيلاء على الأراضي عن طريق الحرب وما زال القرار يشكل صلب المفاوضات والمبادرات الرامية إلى وضع حد للصراع العربي الإسرائيلي حتى يومنا هذا لكن الأمور لم تسر على هذا النحو المريح للعرب الذين سارع أكثرهم إلى قبوله رسميا بل سرعان ما أثار الجدل حول الفقرة الفرعية الأولى من الفقرة القاضية بانسحاب القوات المسلحة الإسرائيلية المهم نجي على نص القرار بالإنجليزي يقول With the draw of Israel armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict يقول النص الفرنسي هو القرار من يصدر يصدر باللغة الأمم المتحدة اللغة الفرنسية واللغة الإنجليزية وأنا معه في اللفظة الفرنسية ما لتي أشياء ما حتكون لي أنا من زمان يقول Retreat the forces army Israeli the territory occupy arrow the recent conflict يقول وين تكمن المشكلة يقول يتضح بالنصين إنه مشكلة في غياب أداة التعريف ذا في النسخة لا. الإنجليزية وأنا أريد أن أقول هذا دكتورة قبل كلمة تيراتريس بينما توجد نعم دكتورة تسمحي لي هذا The problem here is with the insertion of the or the أي. omission of the with the drawal from lands نعم. occupied by the by Israel and from the lands occupied by the Israel. The من نقول the lands من الأراضي المحتلة. ما الأراضي التي احتلت؟ الأراضي التي احتلت يعني معرف عن التعريف. اللي من نقول withdrawal from the lands occupied by Israel and from lands occupied by Israel. ذا حددت لنا المواقع معينة. لكن Lands ما حدثت إنه ممكن تسحب مكان ظل مكان لكن نقول the lands يعني من كل الأراضي المحتلة إن هون the is inclusive you see 
فهي هاي الذا هي الذا بس سببت في ضياع الاراضي الفلسطينيه. الاراضي 242 صح. هاي هاي على مود ذا. فهاي اللي يعني ما يكون ملم المترجم باللغه يعني يتسبب في مصائب. مصائب جمة على صعيد الليجل ميديكو نعم الاراضي المحتله محدده اراضي نعم. محتله كيف محدده نعم نعم شكرا جزيلا شكرا اهلا عيني دكتور نعم دكتوره فوز المشاكل الترجمه والمصائب اللي عملتها كثيره كثيره بالحقيقه بالعالم اتذكر اتذكر احد ترجم المترجم مال السادات ارتكب ارتكب يعني مشكله كبيره على كلمه احرث المطارات هو قال احرث المطارات اسرائيل تحسب احرث المطارات يعني حضر ترجمه ترجمه انه يعني حضروا المطارات واحنا نقصد يعني احرث المطارات هو قصد احرث المطارات يعني انزعوا السلاح بالعكس تماما فصارت ضجه كبيره بوقتها فاخطاء الترجمه اكو جسيمه بها مشاكل كثيره ومنها ايضا ترجمه المح... الترجمات بالمحاكم يعني مثل ما ذكرت قبل شويه محكمه استئناف نينوى وكلفوني في ترجمه قالوا لي هاي خامس ترجمه احنا مترجم نطلب ما عاد نعرف هذا قانون هذا ال... ال... الكونتراكت ملزم ام لا وطبعا ملاي 100 مليون دولار قيمه العقد مع مستشفى ابن سينا على مود محرقه يعني جهاز محرقه كبير يحكم بها النفايات الطبيه فتاخر ابو العقد اللي هو من كردستان فبعدين الحكم بالموسم صار على ترجمتي اللي كانت هي قرار ملزم انه طلع انه العفو الكونتراكت طلع ملزم فعليه خسرت الشركه العقد وحاكموا للحكومه مالنا يعني للحكومه المحليه انه ما تدفع ما تدفع له كل شيء، ما الحكومه والله منظمه منظمه امريكيه كانت تجيب محرقه لمستشفى ابن سينا، فهذه احد التجارب اللي عندي في الترجمه، نعم، سؤال اخر اكو واحد فتح نعم ممكن نعم. ممكن اخذ موقف دقيقه؟ اتفضل اتفضل استاذ قتيبه معك Okay, one thing for, uh, this is a very general command that when we come to talk about translation, it is preferred that the one or, I mean, to become a translator or interpreter, especially here we are talking about legal translation, it is better that the person who is going to do the, trans the translation, that he knows at least, I mean, not he is a professional of law, but at least he knows something about law. Because he's going to do what? He's going to deal with, um, with, 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 uh, with, with, with the items or words or sentences that are taken from the law. If he doesn't he know anything knowledge. about law, he he's going to commit. He's going to commit. He's going to commit mistakes. Yes. So this is why it is preferred that the. I mean, everyone who is going to do translation. Previously, he should know, I mean, he should know what he is going to translate, whether it is literary translation or a legal translation or whatever it is. So the one or a good translator or a good interpreter, he should know at least, I mean, if, if not, uh, as I said, if not, he is a professional translator or interpreter, he should know something about the subject what he is going to translate. I mean, to avoid mistakes, like the mistakes which is, which is made by that you have just mentioned. And thank you very much, Professor Rafa. Thank you. Thank you, Ustaz Qutayba. I'm now in the presentation that I have the legal translation. I said there are two types of translation, which is called convenience translation. Any one who is specialized in English, they call it convenience translation, they call it convenience translation. فبالمحاكم الدولية المحترمة لا تعتمد ترجمة الشخص الغير متخصص بال بال بالقا... يعني بكلية القانون أو ما عنده شهادة قانون فبس يعترفون بالترجمة لشخص عنده شهادة في كلية القانون فلهذا يعتبروها أوثنتيك بينما شهادة اللي عنده تخصص ترجمة ويترجم يعتبر كونفينينس ترانزليشن يعني ما ياخذون بها بالمحاكم هسا عندنا سؤال مثل ما قلت هسه عندنا سؤال اخر شكرا استاذ قطيبه احمد عامر 
ايه نعم استاذ براء محمد عنده شو ذا تيرم ليجل ترانزليشن بي يوزد اونلي فور تكست هافينج ليجل افكتس وش هو السؤال شو ذا تيرم ليجل ترانزليشن بي يوزد اونلي فور تكست هافينج ليجل افكتس يس اوف كورس يس اوكي سؤال اخر احمد عامر وات ار ذا فيتشرز اوف انجلش اند عربيك ليجل تكست هذا سؤال عام وات ار ذا وات ار ذا فيتشرز اوف انجلش اند عربيك ليجل تكست سؤال عام جدا هذا وات ار ذا فيتشرز اوف انجلش اند عربيك ليجل تكست ما ممكن سؤال عام هذا ما يتجاوب ما استاذ باسل دكتور باسل This is not a question. Yeah. What are the features of English and Arabic what legal features? text? What are the features of the teacher? لا, the features of English and Arabic legal text. ما ممكن ما أكو هاك سؤال يعني. أسأل لو فد وحدي ما يخالف. I think he means what are the characteristics of legal texts. I think. Maybe he And means this. Okay. I talked about this at the beginning of my lecture. Yes. Some features. He says some features. What are, what are the uh, some of the features of English and Arabic legal text? The use of archaic expressions, very long sentences, uh, uh, conditional uh, abundance of conditional constructions, uh, passivization is highly used, rarely use of uh, of. Uh, Uh, personal pronouns, etc., etc. All these are characteristic features of English legal texts or legal discourse. Yes. Any other question? I think. Uh, yes, Khulutsi one. I think it's. Can, Any other question? Can, can legal translation be affected by policy or regime? Can legal translation be affected by policy or regime? طبعا هذه ما honest translation, not honest. If it can be affected by politics or politicians. دكتور باسم واضح السؤال؟ يقول لك يعني الترجمة تتأثر بالسياسيين وبالسياسات المتبعة؟ لا مفروض لا مفروض translation هي بشكل عام it has to be يعني honest translation. طبعا اكو سؤال اخير هذا سؤال اخير تعبنانه الدكتور. I have another question. What is the reason behind using so long sentences in legal language? Legal language? This is a very good question. Yeah. In fact, one of the characteristics of legal English is the very long sentence because the legislator and not the judge, the legislature, the legislature or the legislator, let us say, it tries to make his sentence all inclusive and his words means exact, his words mean exactly what they say. This is why the sentence, uh, why, this is why the legal sentence is very long. There are very long restrictions Uh, definite articles, uh, sorry, uh, uh, restrictive relative clauses, in order to specify the action or the criminal person. So the legislator, uh, the legislator, wants to be all inclusive, to mention everything in one sentence, so that the words say what they exactly mean. Dr. Basim, thank you. We have two questions. Are you uh, okay to to just uh, to answer quickly? I think we have enough. So, if Zainab is here, she will ask a question. Can we read the question? Dr. Basim, Zainab is here. In the end, in the end, Dr. According to what you said, Dr. You mean that we have many problems in legal text translation transaction. Mm. Legal text transaction. Legal how, transaction. Yeah. How we can, how, how can we solve these problems? At least, how can we find a method to reduce these problems in general? 
او كان يريد ريس يعني هاي تحكي على الترجمه الماليه القانونيه او كان يساوي I said that in order to overcome these problems, we have to take into consideration not only words individually, but words in relation to other words within the same text. We have to take into consideration collocation, reiteration, the relationship between uh, the information structure. All these should be taken into consideration. And as I said, legal translation is not an easy task. It is one of the most difficult types of technical translation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Akhir Soal. Does, does context affect or affect? I think it should be affect. Does context affect the legal text like other types of translations or not? No. As I said, no, because we are basically concerned with context not with context okay very clear thank you very much thank you very much dr basim for this very much enlightening and uh, very enlightening thank you very much dr wafa and i thank you very much dr abdullah for your أشكرك دكتور عبد الله ما قصرت أشكرك جدا على كل شيء